covers that. She covers the pretty part. Yeah. The good looking part. Oh, that's okay. I got Everybody look at her. We'll play. Don't look it's it up. It's okay. Yeah, because then. Okay, yeah, once we get done with that group of three, you can sit down. And then. Because uh, then we will roll yeah. into a group of four more. Just go pull that out. I think we're close enough. Good morning and welcome to Okites Covenant Church. Uh, my name is Amy, and I am the Christian Formation Pastor here. If you, I haven't met you yet, um, we're really grateful to have not only this wonderful bluegrass group here, but also you as well and those joining us from home. Um, I will direct your attention to the bulletin if you haven't um, gotten one yet. Uh, they're by the door, uh, and there's just a couple of uh, brief announcements in here. Um, the first one is after the service, there will be a retiring offering that we can bless and encourage Zach and his family with. Um, also, I had got a notification from Pastor Steve this morning. Um, for those that are unaware, Pastor Steve is our senior pastor, and he and our church chair, Dave Conrad, have been in California this past half week um, at our annual meeting, and he reports that positive things have happened. Um, and that's pretty much all that I've gotten when, in regards to nitty-gritty details. However, he did say that he and Dave will be planning a Wednesday evening kind of update for those that want to stay well in tune with what's happening in the uh, National Covenant Church. Um, other brief things is we are super grateful for the offerings that we had during VBS. Last week we announced that we were just over 500. A couple other uh, donations have come in, and so Operation Hope will get closer to, uh, it'll be $526.36, which is fantastic. And then uh, other volunteer opportunities are coming up, um, including next week we will be commissioning our mission trip students and adults. So if you are in our neck of the woods, if you're visiting and would like to see that, that'll be happening next week. Otherwise, I am going to hand it off so that we can start worshiping together. So there you go. All right, good morning. It's, uh, it's awesome to be here. It's always fun to come and play and worship the Lord together with you. And, and uh, we're going to start out, you know, in this world that we're living in, there's things are happening and changes and, and everything's crazy and we don't agree with it all. Uh, this first song is uh, what we can hold on to. God, hold on to God's unchanging hand. He is the same today as he was yesterday and he will be the same tomorrow as he is today. <laughs>
journey is completed When the valley you pass through Fed by the home and glory Your enraptured soul will view Old tuned God's unchanging So I just want to again say how uh, blessed I feel to be able to be here today to worship together. It's so awesome to be able to freely and publicly worship Christ with all of you. And uh, I just want to thank the Lord for that now. Father Jesus, we just praise you. We thank you. We lift you up, Lord Father, uh, to be able to join together to worship you, Lord, is an amazing, wonderful thing for us here. And we just thank you, Jesus, Father, for all you've done for us, for this community, this congregation, uh, for me personally, for Zach. I just pray, Lord, that you will bless his, his message today. And we just thank you, Lord, that we can be here together to worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to continue and let Dave take over. Yeah, this one is uh, called Angel Band. It's an old bluegrass song, so I'll uh, sing along if you know the words. And uh, it goes something like this. My latest son is sinking fast. My race is nearly run. My strongest trials now are past. My triumph has begun. Oh, I 
sing with us you can if you want to sit you can sit I'm sitting <laughs> but you guys can stand if you want to and sing along please and hand clapping give me some hand clapping right. Next song is, uh, from my memory, is the Billy Graham Crusades from years ago. If any of you remember those, watching those, when he'd do an altar call at the end and thousands of people would come forward, they would sing this song, Just As I Am. <laughs> Just as I am without one plea, 
transition to a time of prayer, isn't it good that we can come to, uh, to God's throne, right into his throne room, on his invitation, just as we are, not because we've earned our way or we've been qualified in some way, but that he invites us, and by Jesus' blood, we can enter right into his presence and praise him there and also present our, our requests and our concerns and our needs to him. So let's, let's enter a time of prayer. If you would like to pray more privately, if there's something you want to pray for, um, look for our diaconate members after the service. They're usually wearing a name tag on a, on a necklace, a lanyard, and they'll be glad to pray with you. We'll start with this week's diaconate devotional and prayer from 1 Peter 4. This gives us a, a great blueprint for living for God. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves... He should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Dear God Almighty, we thank you that we can come before you, that you invite us, and through Jesus' blood we can enter your presence and present our requests to you. So Lord, this morning we thank you for giving us your word to read, to contemplate, so that we can hear your voice. Thank you for the guidance we can find in Scripture. Help us to approach your word with humility. Help us to know with confidence how to pray, 
to love others, to offer hospitality, and to use our gifts and serve others, and to ultimately speak your words. We praise you and we offer our prayers in Jesus' precious name. Lord, as we celebrate our nation's independence this week, we thank you for your blessings on our history, for the wisdom and courage of leaders, for the bravery and sacrifice of our soldiers, and for the service and loyalty of everyday citizens. We pray that you would bless and guide our government and our leaders now, our soldiers and others who serve and protect us. And we pray that you would touch people's hearts and that we would humble ourselves and turn more towards you and your ways and that you would forgive us for our sins and that you would bring healing to our land. And Lord, now we come to you with our concerns and requests. And Lord, we know there are others on our hearts and minds that are not on this list. We lift them to you as well in the silence. We thank you that you know and love and care about each one of us and each one of these concerns. And we pray for your powerful working in each person's life. We pray that you would bring peace and healing and strength and comfort and provision. So we lift up Janet as she started her radiation and chemotherapy treatments this week. We just pray for excellent results from the treatment, Lord, and for minimal or no side effects. We lift up Sam and the ups and downs, uh, the setbacks that he and his family have been going through. We thank you for the team taking care of him, and we pray that you would give them wisdom, give them insight. We pray especially that they would find the cause of the pain Sam has been experiencing and ask you to continue to heal him and to encourage him and his family. We pray for Ben's mom. After heart surgery Monday, having a, a tough week, but doing a bit better as of now. We pray for continued healing for her. We pray that you would surround her and Ben and Amber with your presence and peace and strength. We continue to lift up Katya and Everly going through even more cancer treatment. We pray for Nina awaiting her kidney transplant and Bradley struggling with heart issues. We lift up John as he continues to recover. For Lane and Ron and Bob as they battle Parkinson's. For Charlene and Betty in hospice care. For Bill and Darlene, Diana and Jesse all fighting cancer. And for Pastor Steve's mom recovering from cancer surgery. We pray for direction and peace for the Vesleys, and we ask you to provide a new job for Matt. And now we lift up our missionaries. We lift up Carl and Sue. We pray that you would bring all their plans together uh, as they look towards moving back to Mexico this fall. We just pray that you would bring everything together and that it would be a, a calm and joyful uh, time these last few days here as they make arrangements. We pray for Frank and Mary with their work with international students on the college campuses. And today especially we thank you for Zach and his family and their work with Campus Crusade. We pray that you would give all of these servants wisdom and boldness and energy for the work that you have called them to. This morning we pray for Christ the King Lutheran Church just down the street. We ask you to bless the work done on their high school mission trip to Colorado, and we ask you to continue to work in the lives of those that were served and, and those who served. We pray for their outdoor worship services that people driving by would see and hear and be drawn to join in and that we would be drawn to you. We thank you for our partnership with them in VBS and just in the gospel. We pray that you would guide their leadership and may they shine the light of your love here in Hutchinson. And here at Oak Heights, we lift up our council this week as they meet on Wednesday. We ask you to bless and guide them. We pray for Dave and Kevin and Michelle and Tim, Glenn, Catherine, Julie and Mike and Karen and Pastor Steve. 
Lord, in all these things, we pray that you would be glorified and praised through Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite any children that are uh, here today um, up for what we call the mystery box. Um, For those that this is your first time here, both in person and those joining us online, the mystery box goes home with a different student every week, and they put an item, sometimes more than one, in the box, and we open it together and are reminded of God's promises and his truths um, through things that we find around our homes. Um, And... Unfortunately for Charlotte, she's had to wait an extra week, and we, Mrs. Conrad, I had to text her since she wasn't, she was visiting her uh, daughter this weekend, and she hid it all week, and I said, I don't know where you hid it, so she did a good job of hiding this box, I had to find it, Um, but Charlotte, you had to wait an entire extra week, because last week we were doing VBS stuff, so I bet you're like ready for me to open this, huh? And she she just shrugs like whatever. We'll let Amy live in suspense a little bit longer. Um, all right. So what do you guys? Is it breakable? You told me it wasn't perishable, so that we could wait an extra week. I did ask that. Okay. So we have a couple of items. There is a cross. What is this? It says something. A donkey. And. What people think he is? Uh, okay, so it's and it's a crown. Oh, so I think this sounds like you already have a story in mind. When I was looking at this, some of the things that it reminded me of right away is kind of Jesus' last week at the, like before the crucifixion, um, his the week of the Passion Week. So on. Sunday, the, fir- the Sunday before he was crucified, um, we celebrate it as Palm Sunday, but it was a day that he entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and they waved palm branches, and they laid down their cloaks, and they celebrated, they screamed, hallelujah, praise the Lord, all these things as, as Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem. And later on that week, he was arrested right? The Bible says that Jesus was arrested, and the, the guards, they weren't very nice to him. They put, a, this. I'm going to use this twice, don't worry, a crown of thorns on his head, and they mocked him and ridiculed him and said, hail king of the Jews, and they made fun of him. And then they crucified him, and Pontius Pilate wrote something on the cross. He hung a sign up that said, Jesus, King of the Jews. Again, kind of in a mockery, but really also how crazy is it that God uses things that other people are teasing about to point to the truth? Because what we know is that come Easter Sunday, what happens? He he is risen from the dead. We celebrate the day that he rose from the dead and conquered death, proving to the universe that he truly is the King of the Jews of the universe and the son of God and is able to conquer death. And so through these three items, we get to see the entire week of Jesus' passion, of how he is honored. And also, like what I tell our high school students, is with this donkey, did you know that in that time period, that if people were coming to conquer a city, they would ride a horse? But if they already owned the city, they would come in on a donkey. And so from the very beginning, Jesus is proclaiming that he's got this. This is his place. And so throughout this whole week, he's showing his kingship in ways that are somewhat unusual to to others, but are 100% pointing to his true kingship of the heavens and the earth. Charlotte, what did you have in mind? Anything special? Same thing as me? Yes! It's very rare that I'll get the same exact story as somebody, but I, you know, you really gave me the perfect hints, so it helps. So with that, let's pray, and we'll send this home with somebody else, okay? God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus to, to ride in to Jerusalem on a donkey, to walk alongside and sit and eat with people like us that sin and fall short of your glory. 
that he would be arrested and ridiculed and would climb on that cross to die in our place and then to be risen from the dead to, to conquer death so that we have the hope and the promise of eternal life with you. Lord, we thank you for each of the kids here and we thank you for those that are watching from cabins and homes and um, family vac- like campsites and all these things, Lord, because we know that this is such a busy travel weekend and we know that uh, time with family and is so important. And so we thank you for those that are watching from afar too. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Sure. All right, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. There you go. Those are really well done. And Nancy. Good morning. This morning's reading is out of Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, and in your pew Bible, it's on page 716. This happens to be one of my favorite pieces of scripture. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And there ends God's word. Good morning. It is a treat for me to be here with you today. I'm here with my wife, Julie, and my son, Jasper. So after the service, if you have the chance to meet them, I know that you'll be blessed as a result of that. Every time that I've been able to come here to speak, uh, I've been blessed by the congregation, so I really thank you for the opportunity to be here. When I was in university, I went to the University of Minnesota Morris, just on the other side of the state, and I studied theater, and just after I graduated, I had what I considered to be the dream job opportunity, because I got a job working as an acting apprentice for the Children's Theater Company in Minneapolis, one of the largest children's theaters in the country. And I was there with four other acting apprentices over the course of one season from fall through winter through spring. We had a chance to participate in lots of different workshops and we were guaranteed that we had some role that we got to be in for every single production of that particular season. And my first role that year, that fall, was to be in a reworking of the famous English folktale called The Reluctant Dragon. Now, if you haven't personally read The Reluctant Dragon, that's okay. Uh, I'm just going to give you a really quick synopsis of it right now. As you can imagine from the title, in this this play there is, in fact, yes, a dragon. But actually, he's a really nice guy. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. He doesn't want to blow fire and kill people. In fact, he loves to read books. And so up on his mountain, that's all he does all day long. And a great moment happens near the beginning of this story where a young boy from the village at the bottom of the mountain happens to be wandering up onto the mountain. He meets the dragon. It just so happens the young boy also loves to read books. And a great friendship is formed between the dragon and the boy. But the villagers down in the village, when they find out that there's a dragon on the mountain, they believe that the dragon wants to cause harm. They are not happy about the fact that there's a dragon up there. In fact, they are most happy when they find out that St. George, the famous dragon slayer, is going to be coming to town because they believe St. George is going to help them rid their village of the dragon. Now, my role in this play was to be what you call the town crier. Back hundreds and hundreds of years ago, before we had the internet, before we had newspapers, if you wanted to get the news of the day, the town crier would come into town ringing his bell, and he would shout out all the news that people should know about. That was my job. So periodically during the play, I would show up in the middle of the stage ringing my bell, and I would shout out pieces of information. And my big moment in the play 
was when I found out that St. George was coming, and I would run onto the stage, and I would turn toward the audience, and all of the other actors who were the townspeople would turn toward me when I said the words, guess what? And all the townspeople would say, what? Now, if you're an actor, that is about the best place you can possibly be. I was in the middle of the stage, I was ringing a bell, I said, guess what, and all the other actors started to look at me. I was guaranteed at that moment, every person in the audience was going to be paying attention to me. So after the villagers said, what, I would give the news, and this is what my line was. I would say, St. George is coming, and he's going to kill the dragon for us. And all the townspeople would start to clap and cheer, and we would march off the stage saying, St. George, St. George, St. George. This was a great moment. Now, there is one thing, however, that I haven't told you yet about this children's theater experience. I started doing theater when I was in high school. And if you've ever done theater in high school, you know that you work toward doing this production, and usually you only do the production for like maybe one long weekend. A typical high school might do the play Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, maybe a matinee on Sunday. Now, in college, when we were studying theater, we would do a little bit more. We would usually do a performance over the course of two weekends. So maybe we had the chance to do this play we had worked on seven, eight, or nine times, and then it would be over. But the children's theater company, this is a professional theater company. That means they want to make money. So when they perform a play, they're not going to do it for just one weekend, or not even for two weekends. The plan was we were going to do The Reluctant Dragon beginning in late August of that year, all the way through November, we were going to do the play more than 75 times. Now, what that means is, at the beginning, when everything is new and fresh, every moment of the play is exciting. And I was ready to get out there with my bell. But I remember one dark, cold November afternoon, after we had performed this stinking play more than 60 times, and I was sitting backstage, and I just hated the dragon. And I didn't care about the little boy. They could go off for all I worried about and read books all day long as long as I didn't have to have anything to do with it. And I was sitting backstage basically feeling sad for myself. And at that point, suddenly, I heard my cue. In other words, I heard I was supposed to be on stage at that moment with my bell for my big line. So I quickly grabbed the bell, I rang it, I ran onto the stage, I turned toward the audience, I said, guess what? All the townspeople turned toward me and said, what? And I forgot what I was supposed to say. And in that moment, this is kind of hard to describe, but I had a weird feeling inside of me. Almost like I, like I couldn't catch my breath like I was underwater, like I was suffocating. It's really weird to think about that feeling I had at that moment as everyone was looking at me, and I didn't know what I was supposed to say. Now, of course, you remember what I was supposed to say was, St. George is coming, and he's going to kill the dragon for us. But that's not what I said. Instead, I said, St. George is coming, and he's going to kill us all. <laughs> I said that in front of 500 children. <laughs> and in the next moment, some of them started to cry. Because they were so young, they didn't really realize that it was a play. And they thought, maybe St. George is coming to kill me right now. And all the other townspeople on stage, they were so surprised by what I said, they didn't know what they should do, so they did what they always do. They started to clap and cheer. 
And we marched off the stage saying, St. George, St. George. When we got off the stage, my best friend Greg, he, he began to laugh at me. He fell on his back and he couldn't get up for five straight minutes. Now, when the play was finally finished, the stage manager came up to me afterward, a very kind lady, and she had a nice look on her face, and she said, Zach, it's okay. At some point in every play, somebody forgets a line. But then she said, Zach, I do have to ask you, tomorrow we're going to do the play again. Do you know what the line is for tomorrow? Now, I share this story with you because over the years, I have thought about that particular moment when I stood there, not knowing what I should say, and that weird feeling that came over me. I thought about that because that's not the first time in my life that I've experienced that feeling. I've many times experienced that feeling, and it almost always comes at a moment of uncertainty, a moment of confusion. There's a lot relying on what I do next, but I'm not sure what to do next, and suddenly that feeling grabs me. The feeling of not being able to breathe, not being able to catch my breath. I think I could probably prove, on one way or another, that I've experienced that feeling throughout my life, in some cases, maybe a version of that feeling every single week. When something happens, there's a lot riding on it. You know you need to make a decision right now. You're not sure what to do. Suddenly, that feeling is there. The more I think about it, the more I realize that's not just a feeling that I experience in my life. I think the culture all around me, in one way or another, is using this feeling. I'll give you a silly example. Imagine that you're watching uh, a, a TV commercial or a commercial on the internet, and someone's trying to, sh to sell, I don't know, the the latest athletic shoe. And so, of course, they're talking about this shoe like it's the greatest thing in the world. They hold this shoe up, and they say ridiculous things about it, like, do you see this shoe? This is the most tremendous shoe that has ever been made. If you had this shoe, you'd be faster. You'd be able to jump higher. If you had this shoe, people would notice you. If you don't have this shoe, people are going to notice that too. You're going to walk down the street, your friends are going to look down, they're going to say, well, someone didn't see the commercial about the shoe. And suddenly, if even for a moment, you wonder to yourself, do I really need that shoe? That feeling has grabbed you. That feeling of uncertainty, like, am I right? Am I doing things? correctly? This is something that if you go to see a movie, movies use this all the time, where you see like the innocent victim just about to be attacked by the enemy, and suddenly the theater is filled with that feeling. What is that feeling? I think I could describe it with just one or two words. It's fear or worry. It was fear that I felt that day when I suddenly realized I didn't know what I was supposed to say. It's worry that you're confronted with when you're told by the world, you need this thing. Your life is missing something if you don't have it. And you wonder, maybe I do need that? And of course, in movies and art, it's like an art form. The director of a film knows just how many seconds you have to wait with the camera until we see the innocent victim attacked by the enemy. And the enemy in those movies is a lot like the real-life enemy that we face every day. If you think about it, the enemy knows things that I'm worried about. The enemy knows things that I'm fearful of. And sometimes I kind of feel like the enemy out those doors has just already dug a whole bunch of traps for me where he's just waiting for me to come along and fall into them. Things that I'm worried about or fearful for. Right now, this day... You may be dealing with some kind of worry or fear in your life. I heard during the prayer that was prayed that there's, there's illness, there's sickness in this church family. It could be that. It could be a situation where you're a parent and something's happening with your child and you're feeling turmoil or worry. 
It might happen for a graduate getting ready to finish high school or college, wondering, am I really prepared for what's coming next? I guess the question is, is there anything that we can do for this worry and fear that's basically just waiting there for us? Well, I want to give you a very short answer, a very quick little glimpse at Scripture. Before I do that, let me tell you a really quick story about something that happened a number of years ago with my father. My father was driving the car, listening to a Christian radio program. There was an interviewer interviewing someone who had just written a new book. And the guy who had written the book asked a rhetorical question of everyone in the audience. And they, the person who wrote the book said, What do you suppose was the sentence that Jesus said more than any other sentence during his time on earth? And my father's driving thinking about this. And he thought to himself, it was probably something like, love one another. You know, Jesus, he's a, a loving guy. Yeah, my dad thought, that must be it, love one another. And the guy who wrote the book said, I, I imagine some of you out there right now are thinking the answer might be love one another. But that's not it. And of course, probably many of you know this, the thing that Jesus said more than anything else during his time on earth was, don't fear, don't worry. Now, if we've already established that every single person probably worries and has fear every week, maybe every day of their life, why would that be the thing that Jesus said so often? If it was inevitable that you were going to be afraid, wouldn't that be kind of like Jesus is just wasting his time? Well, let me give you a glimpse at an answer. I'm going to read a short, familiar passage from the book of Mark. If you would like to read along with me, I'm going to read this from Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. So this is Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. You can read it with me, or you can just listen while I read it out loud. A very familiar passage. On that day when evening had come, he, Jesus, said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, he took them with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased. There was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, to understand this passage, it helps if we know what geographically did the world look like where this happened in Israel. Basically, Around the Sea of Galilee, there's a lot of low rolling hills, but every now and then in between these hills, you'll have these cliffs that go down to the sea, to the lake. What that means is, if there's a breeze near the top where these hills are, it's often a nice gentle breeze, but when the breeze hits these cliffs, it slices down, picking up great velocity. Sometimes by the time the wind hits the water, it's going faster than 100 miles per hour. Basically, the same circumstances that you would find inside a wind tunnel. A wind tunnel is a device that's designed to deliberately put more pressure on a machine than it should be able to take so they can test it. That's the circumstances that this particular storm created. We know what kind of a storm this was. This was a massive storm because some of the disciples were fishermen. They're used to being out there on the water. They're out there all the time. They've experienced many storms in their life and they were scared of this storm. What kind of a storm was this? Well, we can deduce that the waves must have been coming down from one or two stories high beating against this tiny little wooden boat. The sound of the wind would have been like a person screaming. Just the sound would have been terrifying. The clouds were there, causing maybe what almost was like nighttime, but then flashes of lightning, lighting up the sky like it's day, darkness, light, 
darkness again, screaming wind, huge waves. These are the circumstances the disciples found themselves in, and they felt something completely normal, completely natural. They were scared. And then they turn, and they see Jesus is asleep. So they do what anyone would have done. They do what I would have done. They went up to him and they said, Jesus, we're scared. Don't you care about us? Those are the words that Jesus woke up to. He was looking at his disciples. He could see their faces. They weren't faking it. Their faces were probably white. So he, he stands up, he puts out his hand, and in the next second, an unnatural calm occurs. The literal translation is, a huge calm occurred. Now, I've heard huge noises in my life. You go to the movie theater, you see an action film, huge explosions, 4th of July, Fireworks, huge noise. I've heard huge noises. What does a huge calm sound like? One second, massive waves, screaming wind. The next second, nothing. The water was probably like glass. The only thing the disciples could maybe hear was the sound of their own breath. And at that moment, Jesus turned to them and said, Why are you afraid? Where's your faith? And you know what question I have for Jesus right now? You know what question I want to ask Jesus? Why did he ask them that? Isn't it obvious why they were scared? The person who wrote this deliberately wrote it in such a way that we would know they had plenty of reason to be scared. It was a huge storm. There were incredible waves. There's screaming wind. And what kind of a thing is it to say to someone, by the way, when they're already scared, why are you scared? That's like rubbing your face in something. Why would Jesus ask them that? Who... Does he think he is? And you know why that's the question that I have in my heart so often toward Jesus? Because so often in my own life, I don't really know who Jesus is. You know what he's really saying to those disciples 2,000 years ago? You know what he's really saying to us here today? He's saying, do you know who I am? Do you know what I'm capable of? What have you seen me do so far? People come to me who are sick. They leave feeling better than they've ever felt in their lives. I have power over sickness. People are hungry. They bring me a couple pieces of bread, a couple pieces of fish. I make enough to feed 5,000 people. I have power over the physical world. Right now, a massive storm, screaming wind. The next second, nothing. I have power over the weather. And I'm taking you somewhere where they're going to kill me. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead, proving that I have power over death. I'm Jesus. I am the Son of God. And you could imagine that I would let anything happen to you? You have no idea what I am going to go through for you. You're my brothers. You're my sisters. You're my children. Whether we believe it or not, those are the words Jesus turned to the disciples with 2,000 years ago. Those are the words he's turning to you with today. He's saying, 
the next time you experience fear or worry in your life, you are allowed to take that thing and just put it aside. Why would Jesus have repeated that so often if it was inevitable that you were going to fear? I think maybe there are a few things that in spite of what an incredible, omnipotent, all-powerful person Jesus was, there are still some things he couldn't understand. Like when he looked into the eyes of his disciples and thought to himself, don't they realize God is right here? That's one of those moments. That's why he kept saying, why are you scared? I've got this. The next time we experience fear or worry, you can just push it aside. If I was holding a small baby in my arms, a baby so small the baby can't walk yet, and if I was standing next to a swimming pool filled with water, if I were to take this tiny baby and throw the baby into the water, for one or two seconds, the baby would cough. But then, you already know what would happen. The baby would start to swim. Because instinctively, the baby, having spent nine months in water, already knows how to swim. And the baby hasn't yet learned to be afraid of the water. Now, in my life, I've learned that I'm afraid of the water. I've learned that a long time ago. But now, we're allowed to learn. We don't have to be. Please pray with me. Thank you so much, Lord, for the blessing of this congregation of Christians. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the privilege of spending time in your word. When we read these passages from the time that you spent on earth, you teach us things that are necessary and vital uh, for me, Lord, for, for us to understand. Thank you, Lord, for repeating so often, don't worry, don't fear. Lord, if there are people in this room right now who are experiencing fear or worry, I pray for your relief from that. I pray for answers, Lord. I pray for healing of illness or for coming to terms with long-term struggle. There's people getting ready for next steps in life, Lord, graduation, a new job, some kind of struggle with family members. I pray for your relief from worry and fear. Thank you that we can trust you for that, Lord. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. So, the Lord is so amazing. Uh, I asked Zach a couple weeks ago, what was he going to talk about today? And then I kind of forgot. I wanted to have some music that might go with it. And uh, two weeks ago, 2.30 in the morning, out of a sound sleep, I wake up, and in my head is, if I were Jesus, and I grabbed my phone, and I mumbled some words into it, and I got up later, 
And uh, I think it goes with what he's talking about. So uh, I didn't even have to put it together. He did it for me. This is uh, called If I Were Jesus. Set your spirit free If I were Jesus I would set you free Show you love and grace If I were Jesus I'd shine upon your face If I were Jesus You'd treat me with disgrace Once again, thank you, uh, group. That was fantastic. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Zach, um, for that wonderful message. As a reminder, there will be a, a retiring offering if you have any gifts you'd like to share with Zach. At this time, um, you'll, it's time for the benediction. It comes from the, the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, so the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, 
power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.